Collaboration, where we'll explore the many ways we make meaning together and why we do what we do, our motivations. I'm your host, Tim Thompson, and with us today is Dr. Jean Jones, and she is a professor of rhetoric and communication mm -hmm. at Edinburgh University, mm -hmm. and she's also the director of the Honors Program, mm -hmm. as well as the president of our local ABSCUF, which is the Faculty and Coaches Union. And what else do you do, Jean? Well, and I teach. <laughs> and you teach as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And write, and, yeah. Um, and uh, try to have a life. Right. I, I love to um, spend time in Latin America. I'm studying Spanish. And in fact, I'm sitting in on a Spanish class this semester here at Edinburgh. It's great fun. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, you teach rhetoric. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit what is rhetoric? Well, you know, that's a huge and wonderful question. And uh, in the purest sense, rhetoric is persuasive speech, or I would argue rhetoric is synonymous with communication. It's the same thing. Um, there, are, there are three levels, though, to rhetoric, but we only have one word, and that's where it gets complicated a little bit. Um, rhetoric, at, at one level, rhetoric is persuasive speech. We just came through a presidential campaign, and there was lots of, if you watch reporters, that they talk about the rhetoric of the campaign. There is lots of rhetoric in the campaign. That's just persuasive discourse, persuasive speech. But there is also rhetoric at the level of analysis where we study the rhetoric, we do rhetorical criticism, we try to figure out how it works, we try to figure out what's going on. And in most interesting of all, in my mind, is rhetoric as a worldview. And this goes back to ancient Greece, where there's a, there was a dispute between a group in ancient Greece called the Sophists and the philosophers, particularly Socrates and Plato. And um, the, the Sophists were the first teachers of rhetoric. And they argued that, uh, or, or persuasive discourse, they taught how to be persuasive. And they argued that um, there was no absolute truth. There are things that, where there are things we believe to be true, but there's no, you know, we, we just, it's shorthand. It's, we, we think that there are things that are true. We think there are facts. But if we think about it, even the things we consider most grounded, for example, if I said to you, uh, is it true the sun will come up tomorrow? You would say, oh yeah, that's true. But in fact, we don't know. We believe it to be true based on science, based on past, you know, everything that's happened in our, in our lives and in our history, but we don't know. And so the rhetoricians, the sophists, the teachers of rhetoric argued that re every time we open our mouth, we're engaged in rhetoric, we're engaged in some level of persuasion. And with that comes profound ethical obligations. Mm -hmm. So for you and I as teachers, for example, if we stand up in front of the classroom and we have the truth and we're going to hand the students the truth, that's one thing. If we stand up as rhetoricians and we say these are the things that we believe to be true based on our reading, our study, our experiences, all the things we've been through, we, when we teach students we're much more humble and we're much more mm -hmm. careful because we realize we're persuading students to believe things to be true that we believe to be true. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's very, very interesting. Now you talk about uh, rhetoric and truth and mm -hmm. some people claiming there is truth, some cl claiming there's right. not or maybe or it's probable. Uh, is that still with us today? Oh my yes. Well, I mean, I, we've just come through a campaign. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, Dr. Thompson. There is, there is, um, just go home and turn on Fox News tonight or MSNBC and there will be all this debate about who told the truth, who didn't tell the truth in the campaigns. And yeah, there is, there in popular discourse, there's great discussion. We may not ground it in the terms of the ancient Greek sophists. People like, like me, I do, mm -hmm. but um, there, there is still great debate about who has the truth, what is the truth, where is the truth, and um, there, there's also great debate where the critique of the sophists that Plato offered in his dialogue, the Gorgias, he argued that rhetoric and, or persuasion is always suspect because it can be abused. Mm -hmm. And he's right. And it, it does can. get abused. And it does get now, abused. Now, how do, you, how do you make judgments? I know there's fact checkers, right? Right. But how else do you make judgments about whose truth is a better truth? Because I, as I bounce around between MSNBC and Fox News right. just to see what's going on, uh, 
both are claiming the other side is so evil and conniving. Right, and right. And, and in fact, um, they're making the case that Socrates made in the Gorgias, you know, that, that rhetoric is always suspect when people use it for base motives. And, and uh, what, what the sophist argue, sophists argued was that pretty much what we call truth is unquestioned consensus. And your, your argument about fact checkers is a good one. When you're trying to figure out if something is true, you'll, you'll say, uh, hey, Jane, I, I think this is true. What do you think? And, you'll, you'll, and you'll, ask, you'll ask Dee, and you'll ask your kids, and you'll ask people that you know. And if we all see the same thing, then you'll, you'll tend to say, well, I guess it, it probably is true, because most of us are seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so the sophists would argue that, that what we consider um, truth with a capital T more often than not is unquestioned consensus. Mm -hmm. If I'll give you an example that I use with my students. Let's presume that um, that I uh, saw a monster on that wall over there. Mm -hmm. I saw a monster. Is it true that there's a monster on that wall? Mm -hmm. In your, I'm asking you, is it true? No, that's no, not true. That's not true. How do you know that's not true? Well, I know because I can verify with my senses and I can imagine okay. that I've never seen a monster before and I don't think they exist. So. Well, you know what? I can verify with my senses too. I can feel him. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, can't you smell him? Uh -huh. I can smell him. Mm -hmm. And he's oozing goo and he's snarling. He's making noise. He's, uh, Timmy's over there. Now I'm going to start thinking there really is a monster. See, exactly. So, so then we get to the question of, okay, we have, we have a question as to mm -hmm. is it there or is it not? And it's a pretty important question. Mm -hmm. Because if he's there, you and I are in trouble because he looks pretty hungry. Now, does that have anything to do with, uh, say, demonizing your opponent, you know, turning them into a monster? <laughs> well, we can get there in a minute. Them? We're not there yet. I'm just uh -huh. trying to make okay. a, a, a different point. How would we check that out? We would get, we would go and get the guys in the control room to come in and say, do you see a monster? No, we don't. There's no monster. And we would agree if 10 people agree there's no monster. And I, and I think there is. That's consensual we would, validation. Consensual validation. We would agree that there's no monster. And this becomes, it's a silly example, but this becomes really important because we put people in mental hospitals over things like this. Mm -hmm. And has the majority ever been wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, we just have to go consider um, Nazi Germany mm -hmm. and we can see where consensual validation went wrong. Mm -hmm. So this issue of the truth more often than not, is really little more than consensual validation. We have to be very careful about that. So it becomes a really complex, going back to your original question, what is rhetoric? On the simplest level, it's, you know, it, it's political ads that we were bombarded with in the last couple right. of months. On the most interesting level, we're getting into questions of epistemology, of how, how do we know what is truth? How do we arrive at truth? How do we... How, how do we make decisions about truth? And if I adopt the rhetorical worldview where I say, you know what, there are things, I'm not prepared to say things are true with a capital T. I am prepared to say there are things I believe to be true. And I hopefully have good reasons right. for them, for these beliefs. But I could be wrong. And therefore, when I open my mouth to communicate, I am... An, there is a profoundly ethical responsibility placed upon me to be careful about what I say. Okay, now you are going to be profoundly ethical, but many of these people who are in uh, a campaign to win political position, it's, you know, win at any cost, right. Right? right? So you're just thinking, whatever I need to say to either demonize or diminish right. or lower that my opponent. So what do we do about that? How do we prepare ourselves when we know that we're going to have different people with these different ideologies, different views, trying to persuade us? I, I think we've seen a bit of, as you mentioned, fact checkers, organizations that do fact checking. Mm -hmm. that, that ha we need fact checking. We need, we need to try, we first need to develop our critical thinking skills. You know, mm -hmm. we need to be able, we need to learn a little bit of informal reasoning. Do you think we get enough of that? Do, no. are, are we teaching our students no, enough of that? I no, don't, I absolutely don't think we get enough of that. When, when in my 400 level persuasion and propaganda course, when I introduce informal reasoning and fallacies, it's mm -hmm. the first time most of our students have ever encountered any of these things. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I, I think, 
and going back to your point, how could we begin to deal with this? That would be a way to begin to deal with it, I think. Mm -hmm. With more critical thinking. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, what do you think? Do you think we teach I enough? I don't of it? think we teach enough of it. I mean, sometimes they might get it in a, a philosophy course. They right. might get it in a few rhetoric courses, a little bit, a little taste. But if, you know, if it were up to me, I think I'd love to see something that has critical thinking in it every semester of a student's Well, and I career. think the other thing is um, making it interesting. Critical thinking is more than just memorizing a list of types of logical fallacies. Mm -hmm. But um, showing, for example, showing, taking this campaign that we've just been through and gathering together the rhetoric of the campaign and showing clips and samples and then analyzing it together with our students, figuring out where are the fallacies, do, does, are there non sequiturs, does the logic flow, does it make sense? I think students would find that very, very interesting, and they would be improving their critical thinking skills at the same time. Right, and beyond critical thinking, though, if you know, we we have our belief system, and if my candidate is saying something that's an outright lie, but it's still it's my candidate, is right. there a tendency for me to want to believe that? I, I I'm just going to disregard critical thinking, and I I suppose I wish it were not so. But I suppose that's true. Um, we, once, you know, we, we are uncomfortable with cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. We, once we've committed, we, we want to see the best in our person. And um, we, you know, we see that, you're, you're right. It's, we see that all over the place. And I think that's, that's why studying rhetoric, to me, is so profoundly important and interesting. Because it helps us think about all of these things. It helps us think about when are my, when are, when are my engaged in self-persuasion in an unhelpful way? Mm -hmm. when, um, when am I, you know, where are, when am I being ethical or not ethical? It helps us to question our own motives and then look at the motives of others. And most of all, it helps us to be humble that we don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. That sounds like when you say self-persuasion, is a big part of persuasion self-persuasion? Is it? You know, like the process of me being persuaded by Obama or Romney or any political mm -hmm. figure or any advertisement, is it, how much of it is them out there and how much of it is me in here? I think we want to identify with people. Mm. And um, I, I, you know, you and I both are, are um, uh, folks who know a little bit about the rhetorician Kenneth Burke and, and we, we long to create that identification. We long to find that person that, that is like us. And um, I think there is, there, there is a fair amount of that. And it's hard, it's really hard to, it's hard to, to criticize the person you've invested in. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, you and I are both married. We love our spouses, we love our kids, but yet we, we can see when they're mistaken. We don't mm -hmm. always agree. So it can be done. We can be loyal and we can um, find, find. Have, have a critical mind. Have a critical things. mind, yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you're in these political campaigns where you know it's win or lose and whatnot, are you, you're probably not apt to do that. What's, what's your assessment of the political campaign, the Romney-Obama campaign that just went on? Um, I think it was, it, it turned out about the way I thought it would. Probably it, tur it turned out nationally a little bit more liberal than I thought it would. We have now elected our first openly gay senator, a, a woman. We have um, legalized marijuana in Colorado and um, Washington State. We probably Washington State. We have um, legalized gay marriage in Maine and Maryland, the country is changing and changing in a more liberal direction. And I think what's really interesting now is we're all gonna be spending time trying to figure out what happened and try to, an and we're gonna to try to analyze rhetoric on the lowest level, you know, what was persuasive, what was not on the lowest level. To me, what's more interesting is on a little bit higher level, one of the things that I've been hearing in the last day or so is um, the country is changing and therefore, and the question, and, and that, that Obama won because he appealed to this new 
demographic. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this weird on, on the Republican side, and the Republicans are the ones doing the most soul searching right now, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're suggesting that um, Ann Coulter just yesterday said on the radio that, well, um, you know, they're the makers and the takers, and the takers won. Mm -hmm. And I and I find that so distressing to think about. Think about that's that way to frame it. The Republicans want to suggest, I think, that Obama caused through his rhetoric. He caused this victory. Mm -hmm. I would say Obama's the effect hmm. of the victory. This victory, Obama and his campaign are a metonymy. They're a representation of the country. Mm -hmm. The country is changing. And we don't see it as much here in Edinburgh. I wish we saw more of it. But this country is a beautiful, diverse tapestry of colors and languages and people and opinions. And that's what it is. That's right. what it is. And Obama happened to embody that. It's, it's much more diverse, and especially you mentioned the demographics. Those have changed with more Hispanics, more blacks voting, and so forth. But what about, I, I saw a, a headline in the Times about the country is leaning more right, but the demographics are changing. Do you buy that? Is that? I think, I think the country is going through a change where you and I will, in our, in our old age, will be, will be probably smiling at the, at the new country. I don't think the country is leaning more right. I think the country, I think the opinions of the populace are matching the demographic shifts. Mm -hmm. I think the country is shifting demographically, and with those demographic shifts is coming new opinions. Now, you know, very often people talk about right, left, liberal, conservative. Right. And you know what? I think many people probably don't know what that is. I mean, you, right. you, you assume you know just because you've placed, you know, they'll talk about Romney conservative, Obama liberal, or right. whatever. But what, what is liberal? What is conservative? And that, that, that's a fascinating question, too. And, and, and we throw these terms around like we, like we understand them. And we can get into what is the classical understanding of liberalism versus conservatism. We can get into pol uh, American political thought over the last 50 or 60 years in America. What is liberal versus what is conservative? And then we can get into the, the modern reincarnation of, you know, that, that conservative is Rush Limbaugh and liberal is Rachel, Rachel Maddow. Uh -huh. um, I think on the, from the broader um, definition, conservative, is about conserving. It's conserving things that were values that are that have been have existed and been tested over time, and liberal is um, is is allowing for progress, allowing for change, allowing for you know. So it's it's the we we do kind of see it in the country right now. Do we want to cling to this idealized 1950s? Mm -hmm. which I certainly don't want to cling to that, but I think there's a large piece of our populace that's very fearful that want to, or do we want to be open enough to allow for new ideas and new thinking? And, and again, I, li the liberal definition, as I'm, I'm, as I'm expounding it to you, um, fits much more closely, I think, with um, a rhetorical worldview. I don't have all the answers, mm -hmm. and therefore I'm open to persuasion. I'm open to new opinions. I'm open to new ways of thinking. So it's kind of that openness is part of it, too. I think Do so. Do you think when most people hear the word liberal or conservative that they have uh, an accurate definition of what that means, or does it just... For them. Okay. For them and in their mind. And, and uh, what's interesting to me is liberalism. I knew that liberalism was a term that that had been pretty much been destroyed for the moment when even the liberals wouldn't use it. The liberals suddenly started calling themselves progressives. Uh -huh. So when the liberals themselves won't embrace the term anymore, then the the term is the, the the stereotypical the stereotypical description presented by the conservatives had become the operating definition. And that was kind of a long process, right? Right, I mean, that right. That was like pre-Reagan and then through right. Reagan. Right, exactly. Really William F. Cold. Buckley and forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, do you th see that changing? Is that is well, that's being what, a liberal going to be okay? That's what surprised me in this election. That was, I don't surprise easily. I study politics very, very closely, and I don't surprise easily. But what surprised me in this election is 
it was, there was a lot of lib flat out liberal um, policies that, that passed in states with voters. They were not in state houses with elected officials. These were referendums that voters voted on. Mm -hmm. And um, now, for example, but we have to be practical, marijuana being legalized in Colorado, it's going to bring them like $2, two billion dollars a year. In tax revenues? Yeah. 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 So, if so they there's, can get passed, is it, they're going to have to duke it out with the federal government right, first? Right. Right. And I think the federal government has far greater things to worry about than, than this. So mm -hmm. I think it's probably going to work. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so I think liberalism had become a term um, of such derision that even liberals wouldn't use it. And now with this election two days ago, maybe, I don't know yet, but maybe liberalism is back. Now, you know, oftentimes we, we tend to get pushed to either side, right. especially during an election. Right. Is that, is that getting worse? Are we getting more and more uh, vicious in our, our oppositions to one another? Well, you know, communication is communication, and, and we can be kind or we can be mean, and you know and that doesn't change but all of the forms of communication have have uh, have multiplied in 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 so many ways that that uh now we can have um Fox News and MSNBC where you will never have to th there's no there's 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 no co there's less community where we where we have to be with people we disagree with you can my brother in Virginia watches nothing but Fox News ever. And to talk to him, it's like Fox News coming out of his mouth. Yeah. And he can't even fathom. He tries, but he can't even fathom. It's, 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 he's, all, he's so persuaded by that perspective. And it's like going to church. He turns it on every day and gets reconverted. Uh -huh. And so I think... The polarization in the country, I'm not sure about this, but I think the polarization in part is coming from the explosion of different um, devices, mm -hmm. different media, media, mm -hmm. and for commu through which communication can be transmitted, and therefore we can, we can find our tribe, and we can just be with them, and we don't have to. And one of the wonderful things about college is we break down that tribe for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. in our classrooms we they're all there together and they have to interact and it's one of the i think it's one of the greatest values of of the university a chance to become a part of the global village instead exactly. of the various tribes right exactly yeah do you see you know we we know that something's broken we know that there's been gridlock right. we know that people are forced to these very strong oppositional camps do you see that changing is is there a way to break through all the gridlock and well, this election was an interesting one because we have we have just elected a um, we've we voted for more gridlock. We have a, we we reelected um, a, a house, a Congress that is not as Republican Tea Party led, but still they have the majority. We have a Senate where we've we've elected a few more Democrats. Democrats are in control, and we've elected some strong liberals and we've reelected a president who is a center left president and these three groups have to the only way a law happen the only the only way anything happens is if these three units come together and find some consensus and it's not in their self interest to find consensus especially in the US Congress mm -hmm. because in 2 years these people are going to have to go back and face their con their tribe, their constituency, and face reelection. So, but what about for the greater good? Isn't there some kind of incentive that they've got to do something because we that's need the, it? That's the appeal. That's mm -hmm. the appeal. But we've not. Um, and and one of the one of the things I, I read an article recently that and I and I'm somewhat persuaded by this that one of the problems with the argument of appealing to the greater good in in Washington nowadays is. That's far less likely with um, easy air travel, mm -hmm. because in your and my childhood, senators and members of Congress went to Washington. 
they had to they, they couldn't easily hop on a plane and go home they had they bought they lived there their their families lived there their wives lived there their kids went to school there they got together they uh, you know at the end of the day they would have dinner together now with easy inexpensive air travel our members of congress and our senators the minute the session is over they're on a plane going back to their district mm -hmm. they don't they don't spend time together they they're on the they're they're in the they're on the floor doing their work but the minute that's done they're out of there they don't know each mm -hmm. other they don't they they are they they are only they're they're associated with their home district. And so it's very hard then to find that common ground with people that you perceive them as an enemy or as an adversary, perhaps enemy is too strong. You perceive them as an adversary. You disagree on policy. You disagree on where you'd like the country to go. You have the voters that you're representing who you believe want you to do what you're doing. And the minute you're done, you're out of there and back back home. So so much for having a drink with the Exactly, guy that the doesn't table happen anymore. Aisle. That doesn't mm -hmm. happen anymore. And so it's it's going to be much more um, it much more it and it's always been adversarial. I mean, we we have this kind of idealized oh the good old days. Oh, the days of Tip O'Neill were Right, so, uh, right. Which I I'm not persuaded were as I were as wonderful as we want to paint them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and and our founders wisely built in this adversarial structure to balance the powers so that no one could steamroll the the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, you know, I, I, I don't see the the only thing, this, this really is a um, transactional relationship with these people. The only thing that's going to break gridlock is when they find it's, they, they have to. It's in all of their interests, they have to. Right. And, and we might, given this recent, um, presidential election, we can, I, I'm hopeful that maybe some in Congress might decide that they have to work with the Senate and, and the President. Well, now they don't have to worry about, you know, completely demonizing Obama and making sure he doesn't get a second term. That's... That, right, that's done. And, yeah. and that, but that's a whole other thing. And um, it's interesting because, and the country is sort of reliving in reverse now what happened in 2004, because in 2000, President Bush um, was, a, you know, was it was decided he was president based on a decision of the Supreme Court, and then he was reelected in 2004 by the people. And so for Democrats, it was 2000 was a fluke, mm -hmm. but 2004 he won. It was not a fluke. He won, and Democrats went through great pain and soul searching over that. And I think now the Republicans are finding the, the same thing. In 2008, well, it was the first black candidate. He was a dynamic speaker. It was it was historic. That's how he won. He just won. Now he won. It's, it's he won, mm -hmm. and the Republicans now have to sit and try to figure that out. What right. are they going to do with that? And they don't. And they haven't figured it out yet. Right. And and I don't and I can completely having law, run for a, for an elected office myself and lost I I have a sense of empathy for what they're feeling and what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Now, along with uh, being into politics and understanding mm -hmm. politics and teaching, uh, you're also an expert in persuasion, and you've written a book with right. Herb Simons, who's right. one of the uh, noted authorities on persuasion. Right. And what? should we be as consumers of persuasive messages what should we be doing to prepare ourselves for them or to try and understand how we are being persuaded by people well i think the first thing is uh... be aware of the um, the not me phenomenon where we all think we tend to think and and psychological research backs this up we think that other people can get persuaded, but we wouldn't. We right. could see through it. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize, no, we're as persuadable, you know, be a little humble and realize we're getting persuaded as well. I, I think learning, um, learning some informal logic is crucial. I, I think learning a little bit about rhetoric is crucial. And, um, and I think trying as best as you can, given we're living in a polarized, society with where you can hide out with your own tribe i think forcing yourself not to hide out with your own tribe mm. is 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 important you mm. know realize 
realize what, try, try to take in the rhetoric of the opposition and take it in with an open mind, not just to ridicule it and, you know, um, listen long enough to, to rebut, but actually listen, try to understand the perspective of the other side. So if I'm an M MSNBC watcher, try to watch Fox News and Absolutely try to open myself Fo up to it? And, well, not, not necessarily to be persuaded by it, but to try to, but to have some empathy. What, what are the arguments they're making? And, and even if they're exaggerated and extreme, where might there be points of agreement and disagreement? Tuesday night, I was um, on local Meadville radio, and I specifically asked to have, doing some, doing some campaign analysis, and, and I specifically asked to have a, a, a moderate Republican friend come and so that we could have give and take with, with he and I, and I'm on the Democratic side, he'd be on the Republican side. And, um, as I, and, and I was talking to him about, we were talking about polarization, and, and I said, you know, I don't believe we're that far, that, that's the other thing, I do not believe we're that far apart. Mm -hmm. Taking, the, for example, an example like welfare. If you watch Fox News, there will be discussion about um, people, you know, uh, the takers, people who want something for nothing, people who are who don't want to work, who just want to take that that welfare check, and and they'll they'll be it'll be a stereotypical presentation in most cases, but you know, liberals, going back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan and before, would say we don't want, I, and I would put myself in the liberal camp, we do not want people to be getting something for nothing. We don't want people to be disempowered and just taking a check and not working. And every liberal who is hesitant, they're hesitant to admit it, but they've been at the grocery store and they've seen that person take out the little access card and, and they've noticed. Mm -hmm. And they feel a little uncomfortable just as the conservatives do. At the same time, I was talking with my conservative friend on the radio and I said, you looking at that person at the grocery store, it might be a young single mom with a couple of little kids in the grocery cart. Conservatives don't want those little kids to go hungry. Mm -hmm. They, you know, and, and on the liberal networks, it may be a demonization of, oh, those conservatives just want, want to starve these poor people. And so we all want people to be empowered to have jobs and be responsible and be their best selves. And we all want the children to have food and education. We all want that. It's just how do we get there? So why don't we hear more of politicians focusing on, you know, we all want this rather than constantly trying to set the other side up as at the far edge on the fringe. I think that's why President Obama won. I think that was the, I think rhetorically, that's what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And and I think he, he had a... He, he had an appeal, a center-left appeal, um, that, uh, that the rich folks have to pay a little bit more in taxes, but we're not going to demonize the rich folks as evil. He, he always put himself, he said, folks like me have to pay a little bit more in taxes. Right. So I think, I think the appeal of this campaign, he rhetorically position, positioned himself as center-left, which to liberals was completely frustrating mm -hmm. because they don't want center left they want left right now but. when you would probably agree that obama is center left mm -hmm. you would think now if you watch hannity or someone like that they're trying to say no he's extreme he's mm -hmm. a socialist a communist a this is the that is the but he's at the extreme how do we how do we know well, it's probably, it says more about Hannity or about me than it says about Obama. It's where I place myself on the continuum and then where is he in comparison to me or where does he, so, so I think that that's the interesting so piece So it's to kind that. of relative. Yeah. Uh, is there, well, going back to truth now, is there, so there's no way to mark how conservative, how liberal uh, someone is? Well, you know, I'm not sure how helpful that distinction is, you know, that, that I think what's more important is what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what, 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 are they, what are they saying? What are they going, and not just what are they saying, what are they going to, what are they saying they're going to do? And what is their record that backs up that they might actually do what they're going to say they're going to do? I, and I think American people 
were pretty smart in this campaign figuring this out. One of the things that was interesting, one of um, uh, Obama's attacks on Romney, and this was a, a conscious choice, he knew he, with Citizens United, he knew he would not have, the, the campaign knew they would not have as much money in October, November to fight the fight. So they made a conscious choice to spend 20% of, of the money they had early, right after the Republican primaries, to hammer, to define Governor Romney as this Bain capital um, businessman mm -hmm. who, who, with a Swiss bank account and with the money in the Cayman Islands and who was out of touch, an out of touch rich guy. And the rhetorically, there was enough truth to that, that that's really what, you know, that it, they're not saying that, they're not saying that, that um, you know, that Governor Romney uh, lived in a log cabin. There, there, you know, there, there's, there's enough truth to the, to the, to the story that they were, they were telling. That he did work for Bain Capital. He did, you know, he did pay very low taxes. He, these things were, were accurate. And but then, what did it? What made the rhetoric real was then when Governor Romney was caught on, caught on tape, mm -hmm. secret tape. I mean, the the story in in my I'm doing a new edition of my. Um, Book with Herb Simons, and I have to put, and I'm going to put it each each presidential election. We put in the case mm -hmm. that changed the election. The guy who had that little secret camera filming got that getting that 47 percent. You know, Romney at a at a rich person's fundraiser saying 47 percent of the population um, they they wouldn't vote for me, and you know they 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 don't want to work and they're dependent. That was the, that was the moment where with Romney's own mouth. He gave truth mm -hmm. to the definition President Obama's campaign set out in March or April to define him as this person. Then, all of a he, sudden, he gave the supporting he, evidence. He gave yeah. the supporting evidence, yeah. and he could not shake it loose. Right. He could not shake it loose. The perception became the reality. Now, does that mean that Governor Romney doesn't care about poor people? It, his 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 theology is such that he cares greatly about poor people. Right, he's gone he's, off and worked on that. And right, and, and he gives 10%. I mean, the Mormons are fascinating. They have their own welfare system, mm -hmm. and, and it's real. And they take care of each other. So he cares about poor people, but he also, there is a part of him that's a rich person that's out of touch. There really is a part of him, and he provided the supporting evidence and then he could never shake it loose. So there is kind of usually these images that we're being fed by the various media advertisers, the mm -hmm. political teams. There's usually a bit of truth that they're built upon, so. Well, this is the other interesting campaign moment is at the very end when Governor Romney ran an ad saying that um, in Ohio that the Jeep company was going to be moved to China. Mm -hmm. And it was, such a big um, whopper that even the CEOs of the car companies, no, fun, no friends of liberals, came out and said, this is not true. If you are going to play fast and loose with the rhetoric, you can't tell a whopper that the people who are hearing it know better. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that the people in Toledo, Ohio, knew that Jeep was expanding. And so, so they, and then the car, you know, and, and it became so interesting because the car companies then came at, but the, and the people who didn't were in a panic. Am I going to lose my job? Is there something that Romney knows that I don't know? Is Jeep moving to China? And so the car companies had to come out and say, no, 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 relax, folks. Your jobs are here. We're expanding in Ohio. We're not moving. And if you're going to paint a rhetorical picture, understanding the truth Truth is in perception in, in many, in, in, in my mind, in all cases, um, you, you have to be aware that if, if you're, if it's so far, what you're saying is so far removed from the reality of the people that you're talking to, you're going to do yourself harm. Mm -hmm. even, even if you're, you know, even if you're, it's, it's unethical, number one, and number two, it's dumb because it isn't going to work. Right. In this case, both the campaigns were trying to paint a different truth of the economy, for right. instance. You know, on one side, we're trying to make it look dire, like things have gone downhill, like, you know, we right. haven't created much, we, the economy right. has fallen apart, this, that. And on Obama's side, you're trying to make it look like we have been progressing. We've right. Been, Where things are, right. It's, it's, 
Obama's argument was more convincing. It was things are not great, but they are a little better, and what we're doing, if we keep doing it, it's going to get better. It's going to continue to get better slowly. And Romney based his campaign on things are terrible. And Romney could have won with that if things stayed terrible, but things got just enough better mm -hmm. that um, it became unpersuasive to folks. Right. Now, often we, when we hear about rhetoric, we hear it used in a negative I know. way. So I know. Uh, is, there, is there bad persuasion? Is there? Oh, of course. Of course. And, and again, that we go back to where we started, where um, in, in Plato's dialogue, the Gorgias, Socrates spells out Gorgias is a rhetorician and he's just the the epitome of bad persuasion he's you know and, and of course Plato at some level is the biggest rhetorician himself because he's creating this story of this imagined conversation between Socrates and Gorgias and putting all the bad stuff in Gorgias it's like a, it was like a negative campaign ad for rhetoric but um, yeah that that um, uh, Socrates' argument is things like rhetoric is rhetoric is cosmetics. You know, it's you're not really healthy, but we'll we'll put some makeup on you and we'll make you look healthy. And and the the probably the you know all the lawyers are rhetoricians. And we you know what would you do? It, and and I struggle with this. Um, if I'm I'm the lawyer, and, and a lawyer is a rhetorician, a persuader, a professional persuader. That's what they are. And I know you're my client, and I know you did it. You did the murder. I know you did it, but I'm going to stand in that court and try to persuade the jury that you didn't. That's, Socrates would say, right there is the picture of bad rhetoric. Right there. You should go to jail. And I'm there, and I know it. But it's got to be ethical. You've got to be at the. But at the same time, there's there's eth you know there's the other side of the ethics uh, that the lawyer would say everybody deserves a defense, you know, um, in our system and and as a rhetorician, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. But I I try to understand why it needs to be done. You know, there there's two levels of ethics. There's the ethics of I'm I'm using rhetoric in the most crass base way to try to get you off and get you so you're free even though you deserve to go to jail or worse and but then there's the other side of the the other ethical piece of doesn't everyone deserve a defense mm -hmm. even you know that that we don't railroad people we give every in our system in our political system so there's political or the the legal ethics mm -hmm. versus the rhetorical ethics and I, I don't know what to do with that. Right, and aside from the legal ethics and the, the whole uh, talking about courts and talking about politics, there's also persuasion in our everyday lives so far as products, services, right. people trying to sell us. Um, right. Is there any way to get ready for that, to prepare ourselves for that barrage of advertisements that are going to be creeping in our life? I, I want to believe that we're pretty savvy. We, 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 are, we do fall for the not me phenomenon where we think it'll persuade everybody else but not me, and that's clearly not true. All we have to do is look at the clothes we're wearing and the, you know, the, the, the we, why we're, you know, um, why I, have an, I have an iPhone in my purse that costs more than some cheaper phone, and why am I doing it? Because I was persuaded by the rhetoric mm -hmm. and, the pers and the ads, that it, and it is fun. Um, but... Um, so I, I think I think we have to be aware that we are persuadable, but at the same time, I do think, you know, especially I'm thinking of our students, and they're pretty savvy consumers of media. I I, I think um, they uh, better probably better than you and I are. Mm -hmm. That that they can see through the the fluff and and more often than not, and and and. I don't. I don't really have a good answer for that, other than just it kind of comes with life. You get, you know, you you get burned a few times. You make bad purchases. You get taken advantage of a few times, and you start becoming more um, discerning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as as we get older, and and you know, we do. You know, we buy houses, and we do have the contractors come in and do the remodeling jobs, and we learn. You know, we better get those three estimates. And here, you know, again, the the getting the compete. Getting out of, don't, not just going with the first piece of rhetoric that comes at us, 
try to get three different perspectives. Those yeah. sorts of things help. Just through experience. You know, I, th I, I guess. What do you think? I don't know. I think that uh, we can prepare ourselves for uh, advertising in general. I mean, we're, we're all so caught up in it, like you said. Right. We're, we're all persuadable, and uh, this is a materialistic society, and we're, I mean, we judge a lot of things based on things, and um, it's tough to get around that. It's tough to pull yourself out of that, I think, to not put so much store in things and owning things, having things, having the newest, best thing, and so forth. Well, and I think you're, you're making a really good point. It's, it's there's the rhetoric of um, should I buy this product versus that product? And there's the, also, there's the question of should I buy any product? Mm -hmm. You know, getting the distinction between wanting and needing. Oh, you know, yeah. And, and of course, most of what we have, we don't really need. Exactly. But, but I do need it now if my friends have it or exactly. my family wants it exactly. or society. And I find as I get older, and I, I'd be curious to know what you think about this, I, I'm, I'm less susceptible to that. Maybe I'm just more tired. It takes too much work to go to the store and get it. All right. But right. I'm less susceptible to I have to go buy that new thing right now, mm -hmm. and and I and I find my mother is even more or less susceptible than I am. You know, so maybe it's as we get older, we just don't have the energy anymore. Well, I've always been almost anti-technology. You know, almost mm -hmm. uh, a lot. Know, I trying to stay away from you know certain technologies and so forth. But I do find myself more and more starting to become interested in. Right. Oh, wait a minute! I better get that, or I better. Mm -hmm. Find out how to use that because I, I feel like I'll uh, be yeah. left out. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. Well, is there anything else you can tell us uh, or need to tell us about persuasion or rhetoric or? I will make a, assuming that we have students watching, I'm going to make a pitch for um, my, my argument, I think, throughout has been one of the ways to have the right attitude rhetorically and to have a good rhetorical worldview is to get out of your tribe. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, whether it's just which channels you watch or who, you know, um, where you just spend your time. And I want to make an argument for travel too. Mm -hmm. For one of the ways to um, develop a good rhetorical worldview and to realize that your truth is not the only truth is to travel. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something that I spend a great deal of my life now doing, and I do it very inexpensively. I travel and I go to Latin America and I stay with a family for $150, $200 a week. And they feed me and they give me a bedroom and they talk to me. And then I go to language school, and then I go and I explore and get to know countries in Latin America. And um, the week after next, I'm going to El Salvador to build a road. Mm -hmm. And so I want to encourage one of the things rhetorically that I think is really important to do is, is especially for our students, they need to travel. And, and if they think they can't afford it, they can't afford not to. You know, what you know as I do, once, we get, once you get out of college and you get married and you have a family and you have work, it's much harder to do these things. Mm -hmm. And so they need to do it. So whether it be going around the world or across town? That's right. Don't That's just right. hang out in your tribe. Get uh, one of the ways, one of the ways to not become a victim of bad rhetoric is to be rhetorically um, multicultural and experienced. Great. Develop your awareness. Yeah. Jean, thanks. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thank that you for wonderful. inviting me. This was great fun. You bet. Okay. And thank you.